Um, let's go ahead and pray over the preaching of the Word, and the rest of us will, not the rest of us, we will open up the, God's Word together. Lord, as we open up your Word this morning, we are reliant upon your Holy Spirit to quicken it to our hearts. We know that whether or not we ever open it or read it, that it is the Word of God, that you have preserved it ever since you inspired it, and you've preserved it in a miraculous kind of fashion, unlike other writings of antiquity like Shakespeare or Homer's Iliad and things like that. You have kept your hand upon this book so that we have the, the privilege and the ability to open it and to read it. But Lord, we do need you to, to convict us over it and to show us things and to give us a spirit of obedience to, to obey it and not to to take it lightly and to take it for granted, but to take it to heart and to follow hard um, after what it says and to seek you, as Georgia said this morning in that word, to seek you with all of our heart as a deer pants after the water. So enlighten us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. I keep hearing a funny noise in here. I don't know if it's my headset or what, but it's a funny noise I keep hearing. Um, we're starting with the same text as last week, and it was a text about husbands and wives' roles within marriage. And I was reading from Ephesians 5, because we're still in our series on Ephesians, nearing the end, only probably another message or two left in Ephesians, and then I have something special we're going to do um, on the book of Jonah. Everybody say Jonah. What do you think of when you think of Jonah? A big fish, huh? A big fish. Um, I love preaching on the book of Jonah. It's one of the most fun things you can ever preach on. It's a very easy book to preach on because each of the four chapters has a very clear lesson that anybody could figure out. And so it really is a fun book to look at. So that's what you have to look forward to. I have a couple Sundays coming up when Andy Opie is going to preach. And that's nice. And of course, John Stevenson, you know, you're looking forward to him on October 22nd. So that's kind of what you can expect over the next few months to the end of the year. Of course, we'll have a few Advent messages thrown in there as well, and I think Christmas Eve is on a Sunday this year. So, Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband." This text obviously has something to say to both wives and to husbands. Paul started with the women, and so that's where we started last Sunday. And last Sunday's message was really geared in entirety to what God tells women, wives, um, how, to, how to act, how to respond, how to, how to be in the state of matrimony. Um, just a very quick review of that in case you weren't here last week. Wives are told to submit to their husbands. And we mentioned that submission might be a very dirty, dirty word in our culture, but submission is a beautiful word in God's economy. One of those many things that Satan has distorted, taken something absolutely beautiful and made it into something ugly and dirty. That is the way of Satan, is it not? I also point out that wives are told to submit to their own husbands. And I just saw the need to mention that wives aren't told to submit to every man, but to submit to their own husbands. And I mentioned that because there are, there are crazy groups out there. There are crazy churches out there, crazy cults, where they try to tell the women in the church, you have to submit to every man in this church, the pastor on down. Baloney. No, God says, 
Wives, submit to your own husbands. God always has a careful order of things. There is no disorder, no recklessness in God's economy. Everything is always very carefully um, spelled out, orchestrated. It's beautiful. It works. And I'd say there's really no question the Bible doesn't answer to anybody who has a heart to listen. Before a woman is married, a woman is in submission to her father. But when he gives her away at the altar, as takes place in in most the highest percentages of, of weddings, when he gives her away, her submission becomes then to her, her husband, no longer to her father, but now to her husband. Submission does not mean in any way that a woman, a wife, is to be oppressed or abused or dominated by a harsh husband. It's a voluntary choice on the part of the woman to yield to one whom God has appointed to be the leader of your home, knowing that ultimately your welfare, ladies, is in the hand of God. Your welfare is not in the hands of your fallible husband. Your welfare is in the hands of God. And that's why you can entrust yourself to your husband in the order of submission because you're ultimately saying, Lord, I'm entrusting myself to you. My life is in your hands. You see all, you know all, you will work all things together for my good because I love you and I'm called according to your purpose. Naturally, you don't follow your husband into unrighteousness. We mentioned that last week. Ladies, if you have a husband that's urging you to do that which is sinful and wrong, you don't need to do it, okay? Respectfully decline. Um, Hopefully it's not happening right here in our midst, but maybe it is. But if you have a husband that's trying to drag you into something that you know is clearly wrong, don't go along with it. Stick with what God has said in terms of righteousness and not foul uh, a man in his weaker, fallen kinds of moments. There's a simple secret to being a submissive wife, and it's to be, first of all, in submission to God. That's the only way it works. Um, If you can't be in submission to God, you'll never be able to submit to your husband. And if you're able to trust God implicitly and submit to him, you will have no trouble at all submitting to your husband. Because when you submit to a husband, you are in every sense of the word entrusting, submitting your life to God, as we said a minute ago. Uh, one of the scriptures that I, I read last week that, that so clearly says that what we're really doing is trusting God as women when we are submitting to our husbands is this from First Peter, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God, see that, hoped in God, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their husbands. He's talking about women who, because they hope in God, they can submit to their husbands. That's how it works. Submission means that a woman will always respect her husband. Sure, ladies, you know your husband's weaknesses. We said last week you could rattle them all with one hand tied behind your back. You of all people know the weaknesses, the foibles, the frailties of your husband. Every woman that's been married for at least a week can start to see flaws in her husband, right? Just as he can see flaws in you. But respecting him and honoring him will go a long way towards making it easy, easier for him to change and become the man that you want him to be and that God wants him to be. Well, let's switch now to what the Word says to husbands. The husband is the leader of the home. This is God's order of things. It doesn't imply the husband is better than the wife doesn't imply that he is more gifted or talented than his wife, but it does imply that God has appointed the man to be the leader of the home, to be the spiritual leader of the home. Now, in Christ, and the Scripture says this, there is neither male nor female. So it's not that we're not saying the man is better than the woman. They're equal in Christ before God. But God has appointed a certain order of things, In human relationships, he's appointed a certain order, um, how it's supposed to work in job relationships, in church relationships, and yes, in the fundamental marriage relationship. 
And the relationship between a man and a woman in marriage is a complementary relationship. Neither is more important in the sight of God, more valuable, more loved, and yet it's a complementary relationship where God has, has, has said that the man is to be the leader of the home. He is responsible, firstly, for what goes on in the home. Uh, and I get that right from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. That's God's order. That's what, that's what this, your scripture says. Um, I, I don't make it up. I don't come up with these ideas. I'm not following the culture. The culture wouldn't agree to that anyway. But I just present what the Lord has said. And the Lord's order of things is always, it's always the most beautiful, the most perfect, and what will work the best way by far. The man being the leader of the home has to do with the governance of the family. It does not have to do with the day-to-day roles within the home. Don't get that mixed up. It has to do with the leadership of the family and the governance of the family. It has nothing to do with what roles the man and woman have. The Bible does not say that women have to do all the child care while men go out and work. It doesn't say that. That has to do with the roles within marriage, not the structure of governance. It doesn't say that a good wife will cook and be the laundress while the man keeps everything in good repair. Now, maybe in your marriage relationship, that's how it is. Maybe it's backwards. Maybe you're the one that knows how to use the tools and your husband cooks all the meals. It doesn't matter. The Bible doesn't say that these roles are defined and this is how you have to be. That'd be rather, um, I'd be rather, I'd say it'd be drudgery, actually, because we'd have to fulfill roles that maybe we're not naturally gifted to. Um, one of the things that I cover when I do premarital counseling with, with couples is what their expectations are for the roles within the marriage that's about to happen. Because typically, a young man and young woman that are about to get married, they each think that their marriage is going to look like the home they grew up in. And so, for example, if, if, if a man grew up in a home where his mother did all the cooking and cleaning, and dad just went out to work and came home and didn't do much around the home, he is probably going to marriage thinking that's what his new family will look like. And if the girl that's about to get married came from a family of origin where maybe her mother had a very good professional job that she went to every day, and when she came home, she was so tired that dad did all the cooking and did the laundry on the weekends. And she probably goes in that marriage thinking that's what it's going to look like. So you put that man together, that woman, you have him stand before the altar, you pronounce him husband and wife, and then you say, have fun. Go at it. So again, the roles are not defined. You work that out among yourselves. Talk about it. Talk about it before you get married, by the way. Um, It's much better to talk about it before you get married. Figure out your expectations before you get married so you're in for less surprises after you say, I do. Um, God's leadership of the home, though, then, though, comes through the man. The man is appointed to have the governance of the family. God looks to the man, not the woman, to set the tone of the home, especially, underscore, the spiritual tone of the home. God doesn't look to the woman to do that. Far too many homes, it is the woman that does it because the man's not doing his job. God is looking to the husband and the father to set the tone for the home spiritually. God's authority over the family comes through the man. That's God's order of of structure. Um, His authority extends over his wife, and then his wife's authority extends over the children. The children's authority, I guess, extends over the dogs, I don't know, and the cats, but, but... the man is the spiritual covering of his wife. And actually, when a, a husband is not being the leader he should be, he actually opens his wife up to harm. He exposes her unnecessarily to danger and harm because he is not doing what God has asked him 
to do. God will always hold the man accountable for the direction the family takes. It says, unnatural for a woman to not be submissive as it is unnatural for a man not to be the leader of his home. And one of the biggest problems in marriages in the United States today is passive husbands and fathers. Men that are not leaders. They're not taking the leadership. Um, they don't want to take the leadership. They don't know how to take the leadership. And they're passive. And so the, the wife is, is tempted or forced to be the leader and to take leadership and to set the tone of the home. That's not God's order of things. It's a travesty when a husband and father is not fulfilling his role, his God-appointed role to be the leader of the home, to set the tone of the home. I'm not going to take time today to turn in the Scripture, but if you want a really fantastic example of this from the page of the Bible, it's the story of Eli. E-L-I. Look it up later. Um, Eli is the classic example of a passive father. He was a priest. He was a man of God. Think of him as a pastor. But when it came to his home, his wife and his children, he was as passive as they come. And he destroyed his family, and ultimately he was destroyed. God basically ended his life. And what was his sin? He was passive. It says clearly he would not restrain his sons. He would not stop them from doing what they were doing. Um, it doesn't say this in the, Bi in the Bible, but if I were going to write a paraphrase, Eli would say, boys will be boys. Nothing can be done. What can I do? I can't stop them. And that's why God judged Eli. If you don't know that story, go look it up. So you, if you are a man, don't become a passive father that God has to judge because you are not being the husband and father that God has called you to be. Men can be very emotionally detached from the home, can't they? <laughs> they might be physically present, but often they would rather sit in front of a device or watch sports on a 60-inch flat screen TV or engage in some other diversion. Other men are just too occupied with their profession. They're workaholics. They're, they're making it big. They're making money. They're moving up the ladder. They're, they're, they're expanding their business or buying businesses, as the case may be. And being a husband and father is taking a back seat. That is a travesty. All too often, husbands avoid intimacy. They don't share emotions with their wives. They don't deal with problems in the home. They just always let it go, always hope the problem will resolve itself, which it won't, because they're passive. Yes, it's hard work to be a husband and a father. It's easier to be passive. It's easier to say, I'm just too tired. I can't deal with it. Sweetheart, you deal with it. It's easier, but it's wrong in the sight of God. Sure, you're tired. Sure, you may have worked all day, and you just want to do nothing, Man, don't be passive when it comes to your families, comes to your wives and the offspring God has, has blessed you with. It's very difficult for a woman to honor and respect the husband who's passive. It's a real challenge for her to submit to him and respect him when he's not fulfilling the role that God has appointed to him. Very specifically, our text says that the husband's role is to love his wife. Amen. And on the surface, that sounds really easy. You know, we picture the Valentine's Day cards and the flowers and, and maybe a little sweet little love note, maybe a post-it note that she opens when she gets to work or something. We just think romance and good feelings. But if we understand what biblical love is, we know that to love our wife is a tall order. And it's not referring to Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day cards and candlelight dinners and things like that. Loving our wife is not good feelings. It's not lust for the feminine form. 
It's not feeling in love the way we did when we were first getting to know each other. You know all that magic, all that excitement, all that electricity when you're first you know, starting to notice that boyfriend or girlfriend. I mean, it's just, it's palpable. It's so, it's so wonderful. Really, it's fun, isn't it? I'm glad to see you shaking your head. It really is fun. And yet that kind of electricity doesn't last. It might come and go sometimes, but it, it never lasts. It never holds your marriage together. That's not, gonna, not what's going to get you to 25 years and 35 years and 50 years someday. It's not. I mean, it's nice when it's there. But I just heard a speaker at Moody Radio, actually it's Janet Parshall's husband, Craig. He said, it's nice when it's there, but most of the time it's not. And I thought, wow, I'm so glad he's that frank. Because people need to hear that, because we have this fairy tale, tale idea that it's always going to feel like when you were first falling in love. It's not. Somebody lied to you if you think that's the way it is. <laughs> Biblical love is unconditional commitment and sacrifice. It's spelled out right here, Ephesians chapter 5. Loving your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. What did Jesus do for the church? He went to the cross. He died for the church. He went through the torture and sacrifice and the thorns and everything for the church. And so if you ever think, well, Pastor George just likes to emphasize that women have to submit, you got it all wrong. Because I think what the man's called to do is harder. He said, you have to die for that woman. You have to lay down your life. You have to do what Jesus did for the church. Husbands in this room, I hope you're ready to die for your wife. Not criticize her, pick her apart, find fault with her. Not dream about trading her in for a newer model. You could get to a certain age. I mean, let's keep it real, okay? Let's keep it real. God calls you to die for your wife. Not to get rid of her when you're tired of her. Not to point out all her faults and flaws. I heard a story once about a... This is an old, old, old story. About a man that was sitting at the island in their kitchen... And he was watching his wife make breakfast. And she was going over to the toaster and putting bread in, going to the refrigerator and get some eggs out and the cheese and go over to the, the stove to start the frying pan on and put some butter in it to fry the eggs and then back to the toaster. And he said, sweetheart, I've been watching what you're doing today. And you waste a lot of time. You waste a lot of steps. There's a much more efficient way to make breakfast. So he explained to her how she could do it and save half the steps. Well, now he's having his breakfast made with half the number of steps, but he's doing it. I only share these things because I like to keep it real. I'm a man. I know I get critical of my wife sometimes, find fault with her. Sometimes I'm smart enough to keep quiet about it. <laughs> sometimes I'm not, and then I'm sorry and regretful, and sometimes I have to say, you know, I'm really sorry, Beth. That was wrong. But, but we can be cruel to our wives. Even though we love them and have a fantastic marriage, we can still be cruel. I'm married to a woman that always forgives me. I think I have one of the most forgiving wives on the face of the planet, and I mean that. She just doesn't hold things against me. She doesn't remind me the next day of what I did or said. She kind of lets it go, and she forgives me. And I count myself so blessed to have a wife like that. <clears throat> so men were called to a sacrificial love, showing a sacrificial love to our wives, the kind that Jesus showed when he neared the crucifixion. I'd like to read from Matthew 26. It says, then he said to them, this is Jesus to his disciples, my soul was very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. 
And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't even know how to read it with the expression I'm sure Jesus used when he was nearing the point of death and knew what he was facing. I can't even come up with that kind of expression when I want to for you this morning. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. That's how much Christ loved the church. And in the case of the church, she was a church who forsook him, went away from him, didn't want him, often shook her fist at him, and yet Jesus loved the church that much that he was ready to go to that extreme kind of of suffering on her behalf. And that's the kind of love that we husbands are called to show our wives. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. In day-to-day life, how does a husband demonstrate love? Well, I'll throw out the husband loves his wife by listening to her. For some of us men, that's hard to do. We've already heard everything she's going to say. But she needs to be listened to. She needs somebody that will just sit there quietly and let her talk, even if we don't feel like it. And, and it's one of the ways we love our wives, when we listen to them and care and show concern, even if inside we're not feeling like it. Amen? Amen. So many men never get tired of listening to their girlfriend's heart before they got married. I mean, her voice on the phone. I mean, everything about her is so perfect and wonderful. And then you get married. And all of a sudden, there's little desire anymore. And something about her voice can rail on you now. And it bothers you. And you don't feel like listening to her. The same woman that you couldn't get enough of her voice and her stories and her paragraphs before you were married, all of a sudden, you're weary of it. Like the man who says to his wife, sure, this is a good time to talk. Just don't stand in front of the TV. (laughs) To ignore a wife or to not desire what she has to say is cruel. It's absolutely cruel to make her feel like she's so worthless that you're not going to give her the time of day to listen to her heart. The man that God has put in her life to love her and cherish her and to care for her. You know, a lot of times, men, you, you might already know this, maybe, I hope you do. Most of the time, women are not looking to us to fix problems. We're men, we like to fix things. I mean, if Beth tells me some problem, okay, we do this and this and this, it's settled. Next, what are we having for supper? She's not looking to have something fixed. She wants to know that I'll listen to her, and that's how she knows I care for her. I'll just listen. She's not looking for a solution. But men, we're so geared to fixing things. Well, I got a tool for that. I got a special wrench that'll take care of that. (laughs) She just wants to be listened to. That's how she knows we love her. The husband loves his wife by building her self esteem. Most husbands, this might not be across the board, but it's pretty much close across the board. Most husbands get their self-esteem from their accomplishments. They get it from their jobs. I know I, I do from me. That's where I get my self-esteem. I really don't look to Beth as my primary source of self-esteem. If I go to like Fars and somebody says, George, this is broken. Can you fix it? And I get the toolbox out and I fix it. I am proud of myself. I feel good about it. And then when they give me a check, I mean, it's even better. And I go home feeling really good. I don't look to Beth primarily to be my source of self-esteem. If you want to attack a man's self-worth, take away his job. Let him lose his job, get a pink slip, and not be able to find a job. It just cuts at the very core of who most men are. Typically, a woman's primary source of self-esteem is not from the workplace. 
even if they have a really great job, are extremely skilled, very professional, very educated, a woman's self-esteem still does not primarily come from her job. It comes from her husband. She wants to know that man loves her and cherishes her and treasures her. One of those foundational differences between men and women he said before, there's a complementary relationship God has built in to marriage. A woman looks for self-esteem from her husband. She wants to be valued by her husband. And consequently, a man has incredible power to make or break his wife. You know, for the man, it's his job. He loses his job. He's crushed. For the woman, it's a husband that doesn't love her doesn't show love all the time to her, doesn't communicate it with words, but also with, with action. A husband loves his wife by speaking well of her in public. I suspect we've all heard men put down their wives in public. It's very uncomfortable, isn't it? It's like when you hear a husband and wife arguing in public. Nobody, nobody wants to hear a husband and wife argue in public. It's extremely uncomfortable. You want to exit, the, exit, the scene, exit stage left when you're a husband and wife arguing. It's very uncomfortable when a husband degrades his wife in public, and sometimes people just laugh like it's all a big joke, but there's one person who's not laughing, and it's the wife. She might be laughing on the outside, but he's attacking the very core of who she is. She married that man because she loved him and thought he loved her. And then when he publicly mocks her and makes fun of her, it just goes right to the core of who she is as a married woman. It's easy, men, to make our wives the butt of jokes. It comes naturally to all of us. You know, I, I don't do it publicly, but at home I can think of sarcastic things to say. I can think of just the right thing to say, which will be at best expense. That's not love, but it comes naturally. We're like really good at it by nature. But it's, it's what we call sin in the words of Scripture. It's wrong. Tearing down someone instead of building them up. A husband loves his wife by being involved in the home, by not disengaging from the home, but being involved emotionally in the home, being at the forefront, being the leader, being the one that knows the buck stops with me. Now, a simple illustration of this, I mean, just, just a, it's a simple illustration, but for most of us, let's say tonight, after it gets dark, about 7 o'clock, if somebody knocks on the front door of our home, you can imagine, I'm not going to say, who's that? Beth, go get the door. <laughs> I'm going to say, you wait here, let me see who that is, and I might look out the window before I open the door, right? And that's what we do, where we live today in this country and all the problems. But that's a simple way. You know, the man kind of takes the protection of the home seriously. I'm not going to say, I'm scared who that is. Beth, go see. It's the door. <laughs> but we can do that when we're passive husbands and fathers in other ways. We're making our wife go out there and put her life on the line, as it were, because we're too lazy to say, I'm in charge of this. I'm the responsible one. Let me go. Honey, I don't want you to worry about this. You shouldn't have to worry about it. I will go deal with it because I'm the man. Personally, I like being the man in our house. I've never had a problem with that, thankfully. I had a dad who was the man, a loving husband, so you, know, you kind of model what you saw. And, and I would not want to be the woman in our home. Um, I would not want to be the, the feminine component in our home. I like being the man of the home. And that's what God calls us to be if we are a man. Man, um, <clears throat> we have to fight for a healthy home. There's a lot of forces out there that are trying to destroy the family. Do I have to convince you of that? I think not. I hope not. I don't want to rehearse them before you. There are a lot of forces that are deliberately trying to destroy the home that God has created, that he intended. And so, men, we have to fight for our homes. Go to, go to war for it. You know, when you see the school is teaching something wrong, 
They'll say, sweetheart, you need to go talk to the school. Maybe you should go talk to the school, man. Go over there, make an appointment with the principal. Make an appointment with the health teacher, whoever is teaching the wrong things, and saying, I don't want my child exposed to this. My child's not going to be exposed to this. Take the leadership. Fight for your home. How do you want your kids to grow up? How do you want them to turn out? What's your dream for your kids? You want them to be sick and twisted? Like a lot of people we see out there that don't know top from bottom, right from left? Of course you don't. Fight for your homes. Husband loves his wife by setting the spiritual tone in the home. He should be the first one that says tomorrow's Sunday and we're going to church. I hope it's not the wife that has to say, honey, we haven't been to church for a while. Don't you think we can go tomorrow? That's not the man being the leader. It should be the man that says, tomorrow, Sunday, we're going to go to church. He should be the first to say, we need to pray when there's a big problem that comes up, something that's difficult, something you don't know how to fix, man. It should be the man saying, honey, let's pray. Not wait for the woman who wants to pray. Women always want to pray. They always wish their husbands would pray. Don't wait for her to say, dear, do you think we could pray about this? Take the leadership. Fight for your homes. You be the instigator, the initiator to pray when the situation calls for it. You should be the first to say in a crisis, we are going to trust God. Every marriage encounters crises. Every single one. Over the course of a long marriage, there are innumerable crises. Serious, serious things that come up. Well, maybe it's a parent that's dying or a, or a traffic accident or a child dies or a cancer diagnosis. Any marriage is going to encounter a whole lot of crises over its course. But it should be the man that always sets the tone and says, we are going to trust God. God's brought us this far by faith. He's never failed us yet. And I don't know how we're going to live, survive this one, but we are going to trust God. Men, that is your job. It's my job as a husband to be the first one to say, we are going to trust God. And yes, he should be the first to say, I was wrong. Would you please forgive me? That's never easy for anybody. I don't know why it's so hard. I mean, you can be married 42 years like us. It's still hard. It's still really hard to know I really need to go and apologize and ask her to forgive me. Why is it so hard? I don't know why it's so hard. But it's as hard today as it was 42 years ago to say, you remember yesterday when I said that? That was mean. Do you please forgive me? It's, it's hard. But just because it's hard doesn't mean... We don't need to do it. And you've heard the pastor say it's hard. So if it's hard for me, don't be surprised it's hard for you. So just say, well, I guess we're all in the same boat. Get used to saying, I'm sorry. Um, I don't want to get on a rabbit trail here. I'll leave that to Karen, of course, to her class. But you know, there's, there's ways you ask forgiveness. What you don't do, Monica, is say, you know, I was wrong yesterday. Would you forgive me? But you were wrong too. <laughs> People do that all the time. All it does is start another fight, right? Because you're saying you are the problem here. When you ask forgiveness, put it all on you. All the onus is on you. I was wrong yesterday. Would you forgive me? They might say, you know, I was wrong too. Forgive me. They might not. It's not about them saying something. It's about you doing the right thing. The husband loves his wife by communicating the security of unconditional love. If he was married in a Christian ceremony, something in contrary to maybe something that the judge did at the courthouse, but if it's a truly Christian ceremony, a husband probably promised to forsake all others and love her, comfort her, honor her, and take care of her in sickness and in health. So most of us men, if we were married in a church-type setting, we promise that to our wives. And we promise that to God, that we will love you unconditionally, for better or for worse, thick and thin, sickness and health, richer and poorer, we will love you. Throughout the ups and downs that married life brings, 
The husband needs to constantly communicate, no matter what, I will always be here by your side. No matter what, what comes, what the future holds, I meant it when I stood at the altar and said, I will love you unconditionally till death do us part. And a wife needs to have that reaffirmed over and over and over again. I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter 30. I'm actually changing the order of this passage, so don't throw any tomatoes at me. Uh, <clears throat> under three things, the earth trembles. Under four, it cannot bear up. Can you catch that? Three things, the earth trembles. Under four, it cannot bear up. And Proverbs likes to do those kinds of number things. A servant who becomes a king, a fool who is full of food, a maidservant who displaces her mistress and an unloved woman who was married. So our scriptures are saying that nothing is more unnatural or tragic than a married woman who is unloved. Nothing is more wonderful than a married woman who is loved by her husband as the church is loved by Jesus with all the same affection, commitment, and faithfulness. If you meet a woman who feels loved by her husband and feels very secure in the love of her husband, you will probably find a woman who can easily respect her husband, honor him, and submit to him. And if you meet a man who feels respected by his wife, you'll probably find a man who has no trouble loving his wife the way Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. Amen. The family is modeled after the relationship of Christ to the church. It wasn't that God had the family first and then said, you know, that would, that would work well between Christ and the church. I'm going to borrow that example. No, he started with Christ and the church, and then he created the human family to be modeled after that. We read in Another part of Ephesians 5, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So if you consider the woman's role of submission again, it is not primarily submission to a man. It's submission to Jesus Christ. And the extent of a husband's love to his wife, again, it's not the love for the feminine form or flowers and valentines and candlelight dinners, but it's loving her as Christ loved the church. What is needed in marriage, any marriage, every marriage, is very simple. It's a giving of each to the other. That's what it is. A woman giving herself to her husband, a man giving himself to his wife. Hard to do because of our sin nature. We are innately selfish. Somebody just uh, gave me an acrostic for the word sin. Self-indulgent nature. That's from Bill Holmes back there. He, sent, he texted me that one day. Sin, self-indulgent nature. It's hard with our self-indulgent natures to give ourselves wholeheartedly 100% in marriage. It's not expected in our American culture. Nobody expects you to give 100% in a marriage. If you're having problems in your marriage, you go to work and talk about it with your coworkers, they're probably going to tell you to get rid of that guy, get rid of that louse. You're probably not going to get a lot of great advice about holding the marriage together, doing the right thing. Be quicker to, well, you shouldn't have to put up with that. Nobody should have to take that. That's why divorce courts are full of cases. In our culture, it's each one for himself and herself. Attitude of, well, if you give too much, you're going to be taken advantage of. So if you love your spouse too much, they're going to walk all over you. That's what the world tells you. And then there's the people that say, and maybe some of you believe this, it's 50-50. You give 50 and she gives 50. No, it's not 50-50. It's 100-100. 
You give 100 whether or not you feel like you're getting 1% back. It's not half and half. Marriage that's going to work is one where each person is saying, I'm giving 100% of myself to you. A true giving of ourselves to the other is impossible in our natural nature, but it is possible when the foundation is Jesus Christ. Beth and I have always said to each other that had it not been for Jesus being at the center of our relationship, we would have ended our marriage. You say, oh, I can't be, Pastor George. Yes, it can be. If it wasn't for Jesus Christ being the foundation of our marriage, we would not have stayed married. He changes everything. When our hearts and lives are changed by recognizing Jesus as Lord, then we're unshackled and freed to love because we know that we're loved by our eternal God. Marriage is a relationship that God has designed to help us navigate life well. It can provide profound stability to face life with ups and downs, including our own emotional ups and downs. It can be the source of some of our greatest joys. It can be the source of strength in some of our greatest trials. It can be the source of security in a very insecure world that changes like the shadows. For many of us, our marriages are far from this. We struggle. We struggle deeply. We don't feel like it's going too well or we're doing too well. But there is a simple prescription that can fix any marriage on the face of the earth, can set any marriage back on the right track, and it's right here in Ephesians 5. If the man and woman are fully and firstly committed to Jesus Christ, and the man loves his wife as Christ loved the church, and the wife respects and honors her husband, then I declare to you, healing can come to any marriage. It doesn't ever have to be over when those elements are in place. Amen.